All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, <coughs> hopefully, you're in the right place at the right time. Um, today, Jim Monroe is visiting us from Toronto. Um, I'm really excited to have Jim here. Um, I so as you'll see from his talk, Jim wears a lot of hats, right? Basically produces in all media known to man. Um, and uh, I, I first knew Jim's work, uh, I don't know, what is it, 15 years ago maybe? Um, it's a machinima piece he did, one of the first machinima pieces I've ever seen called My Trip to Liberty City. Um, those of you who know about machinima, it's filmmaking using recorded footage from computer games. And when was that made? About 10 years ago. Ten years ago. Okay. Uh, it seems very <laughs> old school, but I didn't really make the connection when then, um, I think probably at the same time, you were a reporter for the Toronto Eye, and, and Jim wrote a review of some of my early games that I showed in Toronto also about 10 years ago. Um, and then a few years later, I discovered he's a science fiction writer as well. And then he turned up again at the Game Developers Conference as a interactive fiction game maker, and now again at IndieCade and Sundance as a writer for games. And he's releasing a feature film, and he's running a art and game space, co-running an art and game space in Toronto and doing lots of good stuff um, all over the place. So um, I think one of, the, one, one of the things I hope people can take away is um, Jim's approach to sort of agency, creative agency, really this idea of taking your own destiny into your own hands as an artist and not waiting around necessarily to be approved or published or rewarded or granted, although I suppose money helps sometimes. But I think Jim is a great example of really the, the ethos of, of taking culture into your own hands, whether it's zines or self-publishing books or movies or games. Um, I hope that th that kind of message really comes through and you'll see, I'm sure you'll talk about that. Um, all right, so um, welcome Jim and Rob. And we'll leave some time for Q&A at the end. Definitely. Definitely. Thanks, Ito. It's, uh, it's very uh, generous. Uh, Instead of sort of uh, just sort of putting it out there that uh, this guy's a crazy man, obviously, working in 54 different media, uh, you get a, put a good spin on it, so thanks. Um, so yeah, uh, my name's Jim Monroe, and I'm an indie culture maker and community organizer. That's broad term. Uh, I go under... So in 2012, I co-produced and wrote Unmanned. Um, Unmanned uh, is basically a, a free flash game that kind of puts you in the shoes of an unmanned aerial vehicle soldier, basically. Um, and that's sort of the newest kind of uh, abstraction of, 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 uh, of soldier that, we, that we've known uh, at this point. And uh, this is the, the shaving mini game you do before you drive to work to kill people. Um, and if you, it, you know, like, we had an amazing response to it. We had, um, uh, it was originally showcased at Sundance, and uh, it, we won the Grand Jury Award at IndieCade, which was a total shock to us. Um, and I also uh, released Ghost of Shit Jobs, um, which is a lo-fi sci-fi feature film. And uh, it, it toured this year all over North America and to places as far flung as Poland and Seoul. Um, so I wrote, co-directed, and executive produced the movie. I was also the executive director for a not-for-profit uh, video game arts organization called the Hand-Eye Society. Um, our mandate is to increase diversity, both in the perception of games, to show the public that the range of creative expression in games is broader than uh, Grand Theft Auto and Halo, 
as well as to increase the diversity in the types of people who are making games. So, as you may see, I have a couple of different intersections with art, and to give you a sense of the, the, the context of, of like, you know, how I came to um, sort of integrate all these things in, in what I view as a sort of indie arts practice, um, I'll give you uh, a sort of, we'll go back in the time machine, back 25 years or so. Um, when I was a teenager in the 1980s, um, and text games back then were kind of the king of the commercial game world. Um, just just uh, interactive fiction, that is, no graphics at all. Games like Zork and Lurking Horror, and they were actually best-selling games at this time. And I always loved reading books, but this brought a whole new dimension and agency to, to, uh, uh, to that. So, um, and our, at about 15, I got involved with the punk rock scene in Toronto, and I kind of left games behind for a while. And beyond the music and that I was exposed to, um, I, I also sort of came into contact with ideas like veganism and anarchism, and things that are still sort of relevant and useful to me now, 25 years later. But the biggest impact on me artistically was the DIY or do-it-yourself approach. Now, the DIY said that instead of waiting for permission to participate in the culture, uh, you could do it now. So it started with things like, um, you know, punk rock bands deciding that they weren't going to get a major label deal. They were going to put out their, their records themselves. Or people who, instead of uh, waiting around for publishing deals, decided to publish their, their writing or either fiction or rants or, or whatever in, in little photocopy magazines. Now, I wasn't, I wasn't really um, uh, musically inclined, and I definitely loved writing. So I started publishing zines when I was around 17. And as I say, these are little photocopy magazines that you'd sell for a dollar or two at a show or trade through the mail. Um, and, and I had like literally hundreds of pen pals uh, who I would trade these zines with and who would give feedback in response or send a dollar through, uh, through the mail. In fact, there was this guy in California, before I had ever visited California, who was a 60-year-old gardener uh, in, 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 I think, in, in San Diego or something, and he was a huge science fiction fan, and he would write me literally five or six page typed feedback responses to my writing, and that was more than I had ever received at the hands of, like, my teachers or even peers or whatever. It was a hugely sort of uh, influential and, and very kind of, like, uh, encouraging sort of uh, phase of my life. The guy's name was Don Fitch. So while I was doing this, I was also the features editor for my university, and I was probably putting about 40 hours a week into my, uh, on top of my classes into what I viewed as activist journalism. So after I graduated, I traveled across the country selling a, a novella I'd, I'd written and published, and eventually I hit Vancouver, staying with a guy who I trade zines with. Um, now, at the time, my favorite magazine was called Adbusters. Has anybody heard of Adbusters? Show of hands. Couple of you, yeah. So, as it turned out, they uh, needed a managing editor, so I stuck around there uh, for about a year. And after that, I went back to Toronto and started writing the book that became my first novel, Flyboy Action Figure Comes with Gas Mask. So basically, this book is is a kind of uh, um, uh, corporate about corporate crime fighting uh, superheroes in love, basically. Um, and I started a writer circle where a couple of us, mostly people I knew from zines, would get together and give feedback in each other's work. And at this point, I'd been self-publishing for eight years, about a half a dozen zines, two novellas, and a short story collection. So I decided to send um, this manuscript around to, to publishers just to, just to sort of see how the other half lived. And at this point, uh, HarperCollins ended up picking it up and publishing it. And it went pretty well. Uh, it exceeded their expectations, and they were interested in publishing my second book, but I declined for two reasons. One was that Rupert Murdoch owns HarperCollins, and if you, if you know Rupert, he's a bit of a, a right-wing Machiavellian type, uh, and it didn't really ever <laughs> sit right with me. And secondly, I knew from years in the zine community that self-published writing could be as good as writing published by corporations. So to prove that it was possible to self-publish by choice, I independently published via my new company, No Media Kings, uh, and that was uh, named in dishonor of Rupert, who I sort of figured was, you know, sort of angling to be a media king. And this turned out to be a much better method for me. I published six books this way for the next 10 years, 
and I would I would sell them myself in, in or through distribution channels in in um, uh, in Canada, and I would generally sell the rights uh, to either uh, Four Walls, Eight Windows, or IDW when I was doing comics. Um, basically, publishers in the states, I would sell the rights to them. And at the same time, I was uh, providing DIY sort of publishing articles on NoMediaKings.org, um, as well as um, giving away ebook versions of my second book, Angry Young Spaceman, um, which in 2000 was considered radical. So. That's Angry Young Spaceman. It was uh, about, a about a guy who went to another planet to teach English, based loosely on my experiences in Korea. So a community excited about in indie publishing started to form around the site, and I was able to tour extensively based on, on people setting up book launches uh, in their town. But I also really hated doing readings because of the fact that they're almost always boring um, so instead, I did a performance that was adapted for, uh, from the spirit of the book. It was, I basically got up on stage and did a recruitment seminar on why you should teach English on other planets. So based on this, I was able to set up an indie touring, uh, indie touring circuit that let DIY artists do short performances in seven cities. It was a volunteer effort that sent 100 creators on the road over four years. It's called the Perpetual Motion Roadshow. And around 2001, I started messing around in movies and games, uh, to the point I started joking that I was going to change the name of the company to New Media Kings. A fan of my first book had given me a bunch of pirated games, Half-Life and Grim Fandango, and they got me really excited about games again for the first time in a decade. Inspired by the community of people making text adventure games, still at this point it was in the 90s, so long after it was uh, a, a commercially viable thing, there was a gr there's a group and still is of people that make text adventures and, and, uh, and share them with each other. And I made my first game as an adult. It's, it's a text game where you're a 15 year old who'd given yourself a mohawk the day before they started at the most conservative school in the city. And your goal was to piss off your teachers and impress your peers so you earn enough punk points to escape the suburbs. So that was called punk points. Somewhat autobiographical, slightly. Now, I made it for the interactive fiction competition, and it came in at about 23rd or something amazingly great. Um, but it, it did have its fans, and, and like zines, it was a way for me to uh, start connecting with people and getting feedback in that community. My buddy also just got a, a digital video camera, and I was fascinated by the idea of being able to make movies for free. So I started making little movies, and this was before YouTube, so I started another zine, this one a CD-ROM zine, and called it Novel Amusements. So they're just basically compilations of movies that I come across. I met a, a ton of interesting video makers, and I asked if, they could, if, if I could publish their videos on these, on these uh, little zines. And like a lot of community organizing, it started with the need I had, a need for distribution and promotion. Then I figured other people would benefit from it as well. One of the videos I made uh, for issue number three of Novel Amusements was called My Trip to Liberty City, which I'm going to try to show you here. Okay. Okay, this is just some of the video from my trip to Liberty City. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd heard so much about the place. It was uh, written up in, in newspaper after newspaper. Uh, it's the place where uh, the game Grand Theft Auto 3 is set. I actually had a uh, pretty good experience the first day. I had some, ran into a uh, uh, a little bit of work. To, uh, to give you this, fella so gave me some yeah, money just to, yeah, to drop a, a girlfriend of his. The next day I show up and, and he uh, he had a Some kind of more uh, dubious exactly kind of uh, mission for me. Go and introduce a bat to his face. Then take his car, respray it. I want compensation for this insult. You know, I, I just didn't feel like it. I mean, it was it was a great day, it was beautiful out, the sun was shining, and I don't, you know, I don't even play baseball, much less, you know, when I kill someone with a baseball bat, you know, so, you know, I'd, I felt like maybe I'd sort of misled him, because I was kind of, 
you know, I look like a thug, the default player skin is a thug, so I decided to change it to something that was like a little bit more reflective. Um, this is the Canadian tourist skin we made, and has the big grin and a camera, and there's a lot of talk about all the cars in Grand Theft Auto and all this kind of thing, but I never feel like, you know, getting into a car is the best way to see a city. I feel like if you really want to see it, then you should just you know, walk around and get to know it a little bit on foot. Like, for instance, here I found this little nook in, a, in an alley. Um, I just went down the alley on a hunch, and sure enough, there was a, a stairwell there, and you can see leads right up to this beautiful rooftop. It's uh, something I never would have found in a car, you know. And uh, rooftops have a special place in, in my heart, and obviously the game designer's hearts as well, because they put a lot of effort into making it, uh, you know, the it's kind of a tribute, I feel, to urban spaces. A lot of uh, things in Grand Theft Auto, including this rooftop. But, uh, you know, I, I got a good sort of view of my neighborhood here. and So, yeah, you can check it out on YouTube if you want to watch the rest. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I basically made that, um, the video to, um, where are we here? To sort of, I, I mean, obviously there's a, the joke about being a Canadian Canadian tourist, but on some levels, I, I did want to show people, um, I did want to show people what I found really uh, compelling about that world that otherwise wouldn't see, uh, wouldn't wouldn't install the game, wouldn't play the game themselves, to to the extent that um, all the all the detail that goes into that particular game, um, uh, it, it's sort of more than it needs to be. So I, I really, I, I it's almost the beginning of my sort of video game advocacy in, in, to a certain extent because um, I was basically showing uh, people in the art world what was sort of going on in the video game world. So, you know, and, and originally I had come up with this concept when the local weekly sort of asked me to start writing about video games. And, and you know, in, in some ways this little video became, uh, like that I made in an afternoon, became like one of the biggest things I've, I've ever done in terms of the people that watched it on, online and whatnot. Um, there wasn't a lot of competition back then, so, you know, uh, that was probably why. But, um, you know, I, I think what distinguishes it from most machinima, um, which came later, is, is that it's not really made for gamer audiences. It's made for a general audience, and, and it's not really full of the in-jokes that a lot of machinima is. So I wrote about games every two weeks for two years um, for the weekly in Toronto. And through this, I met uh, Reagan and Mare, who um, made this amazing game called N, which is actually still available as a, fra a free flash download. Um, and it was a, 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 a freeware sort of platformer. And uh, I was basically the first person to interview them. And they were the, the first indie game makers who weren't really just creating portfolio games, like games to get jobs at big studios. They were the first people that I, I talked to that wanted to do everything to kind of like craft the aesthetic as well as the game mechanics and, and even sort of like, you know, putting it out in the world. And the, they, were the, they were sort of the beginning of what I started to think of ar as artisanal game makers. So people that uh, took something that other people would consider a, a, a detriment, that there's a, only two people in, in, in their studio and made it an asset. And I ended up getting out to the uh, Game Developers Conference in 2005 and had the surreal experience of sitting at their table as they won the, the IGF Audience Choice Awards. Now, beyond the strangeness of uh, people I know getting the award, there was the whole ceremony. There was the way the IGF Awards and, and the Game Developers Choice Awards are back to back. It's kind of like having Sundance and Oscars are at the same sort of ceremony. And, and it's having like the sort of the indie and the corporate game culture in the same room together, kind of acknowledging the symbiosis between the two, um, made me sort of aware of the fact that, uh, that this culture was a lot less divided in some ways than um, the division between indie and corporate that I've experienced in other cultures. After five issues of the novel amusement scene, um, which at this point had become a DVD, 
I approached some of the video makers and saw just to see if they wanted to uh, direct a small segment of a feature that I would write. So operating on the Zoltron principle, um, I wrote seven 12-minute episodes that combined to form a feature. And this was that feature. It's called Infest Wisely. It was a lo-fi sci-fi movie in that we were more interested in sort of ideas than spectacular effects. Um, for one reason, because we spent $700 on this feature. And, uh, and it took us six months to make. So um, given that it premiered at the DEF CON hacker convention in Las Vegas, we figured that they paid more to fly us out than we did on the movie. <laughs> so at this point, I'd done a fair amount of writing about and movies about games, but I hadn't actually made a game for about seven years. I had, I've had, two, I had two team-based uh, games at that point that failed due to a programmer flaking. So around this time, I was really inspired by Emily Short's Savoir Faire, and I decided to make a new text game. I knew Michael Cho from the comics world, and he was super into text games. Um, so I wrote Everybody Dies, and he did the illustrations for it that it became known for. Now, it got a fair amount of attention. It placed third in the interactive fiction comp um, and was an IndieCade nominee. And this was a really pleasant surprise that the indie game world considered it a real game, considering that it, it's so text heavy. Well, Michael's style is often compared to Dan Clouds or, or uh, Burn, Charles Burns in comic circles. The illustrations were of a style not seen before in games and really stood out. So I became aware that the access I had to the creators in other fields allowed me to bring something new to games. So I talked to Reagan and Mayer from MetaNet, and they and John Mack from Queasy gave me $2,000 to sponsor the Artsy Games Incubator. This was intended to help artists without programming skills make a small game in six weeks. Basically, we uh, exposed them to point and click tools, we gave them a structure in which to, to sort of uh, you know, iterate and to, to um, sort of approach a game, uh, and, and it worked out really well. We ran it five times. We had people like Miguel Sternberg, um, who, made, who recently released They Bleed Pixels, Ben Rivers, who released Home, and Craig Adams, uh, who made Sword and Sorcery, uh, all participated. The thing that was amazing about it for me was seeing how much international attention we got for it. Write-ups in Game Set Watch, Paolo Pertersini from Mala Industria got in touch, who's one of my favorite game makers at the time. And compared to the most ambitious things I'd done in the publishing world, such as the, the Perpetual Motion Roadshow, the response for this relatively small project was amazing. We showcased the games at a zine fair in Toronto because I knew that, that the kind of handmade games that they were would appeal to people who made handmade books. Jim McGinley, founder of Toe Jam, which is the unfortunate name for the Toronto Indie Game Jam, um, collaborated with me to make the event happen and was so good to work with that I thought we should join forces. So myself, Reagan and Mayor, John Mack, Miguel, and Jim McGinley got together and started talking about how we would start to do more stuff together, and this became the Hand-Eye Society. So based on the what do we want ourselves principle, we decided it would be good to have meetups so we could show stuff in progress and that kind of thing, but at an event that was culture focused instead of industry focused. We wanted it to have the vibe of a book launch or a rock show or an art uh, opening rather than a job fair. The first Hand Eye Social in 2009 featured Paolo Perdicini and he gave an amazing speech about how he was going to destroy our industry and people cheered. Since then, we've incorporated as a not-for-profit, done a series of fairly groundbreaking initiatives, and we built the first indie arcade cabinet, the Torontron. So the Torontron is basically a, a classic arcade cabinet that we ripped the guts out of and filled it full of uh, Toronto games, basically games that were made by developers in the area. And we sort of looked at it as um, uh, almost as like a semi-mobile game gallery so that people in, in the general public could uh, be exposed to the games that they sort of otherwise would have assumed were made somewhere far away. This went on to inspire the Winatron and community-built cabinets worldwide. Like I think there's something like 15 or 20 of them that people have made um, across the world. And last year, thanks to a partnership with the Toronto International Film Festival and OMDC funding, we were able to run two initiatives uh, that I'm going to talk about today. 
Comics vs. Games, which teamed up comic artists and game makers to create several small games were and that were showcased at the Toronto Comic Arts Festival. And a, a fun LA fact is that Adam from LA Game Space um, did a project called Art vs. Games that uh, was the kind of inspiration for this. And we also did the Difference Engine Initiative, um, which was inspired by Robin Hunnicke's Indie Summit talk on diversity in games. And I'll give you a little uh, video encapsulation of that. TIFF Nexus is a series of creative jams, it's a series of conferences, it's designed to bring diverse creators from the filmmaking, the game making, the digital art worlds together to share ideas, to learn from each other, to learn from industry professionals and experts, to do hands-on workshops and creation together, to really innovate. The Difference Engine Incubator was a six-week program for creative people who had no programming experience to come in and make a simple game. One of the big inspirations for the Difference Engine initiative was the underrepresentation of, of women in the games community. We were really interested in kind of introducing small groups of women uh, into the community as game makers and to see what kind of impact they had on, on the culture. So we took them through a crash course on game design and showed them simple point and click tools that didn't require any programming and really allowed them to put their ideas at the forefront. It was very interesting to see how they used those different talents to come up with something entirely different. My game is a point and click adventure about nerds. It's sort of an absurdist comedy that sort of translates into horror eventually. You pilot a cyclist trying to make their merry way from their house to their job without dying. You duck cabs that are trying to kill you and flying logos of a certain transit organization that are also trying to kill you and cube vans which are, no prizes for guessing, trying to kill you. It's about a woman named Adeline who wants to elope with her lover. So she needs to try to sneak out of the house without letting any of the servants see her and try to steal jewelry to help her start her new life and she can also drink invisibility potions. My game is a 3D platformer and it's the story of a girl who crash lands on a planet and now she has to escape. My game is like a basic side-scrolling platformer based on creation. <laughs> Enter music video and you uh, destroy basic bitches with swag while you're scrolling through this Super Mario-esque kind of world. You're a girl and you're in prison and the goal of the game is to build a gang and take over the prison. It's basically a choose your own adventure, yes or no kind of question game. My game is called Unicorn Justice Fighter slash Unicorn Robber Baron. And um, it's part action game and part political theory simulation. Yeah, you're just a unicorn running around causing trouble. Whenever I send text messages, it's full of typos or like, it's just like drunk autocorrects everywhere. So I wanted to make a game that would make me a better texter. It's if Icarus was a 20-something slacker who lived in the basement and he, his father is a genius and he, he can't cope with that. He's lived on this island for his entire life, but he doesn't know why. Essentially, it's a platformer at its core. It's kind of using very cute elements and also there's a lot of surreal kind of graphics in it. So next to like a cute bouncing bunny, there'll be like a syringe or some rombie. It's called Salsa Loco. It's a top-down action game where they're watering plants to try to grow vegetables to harvest for their salsa, while at the same time chasing out pests like bunnies and beetles trying to protect their crop. My game is an adventure game. It starts off in Newfoundland and she ends up going to another world. My main character is a female. I see a lot of female characters in games. They have kind of the big bosom um, and just like the various assets that seem to be designed for a male perspective. There's a lack of diversity in the games industry. That was one of the things that Jim and I were trying to address. We were hoping to take down that disparity and really shake up the numbers and the types of people who are making games. We are still fighting the glass ceiling and we are still trying to find ways to incorporate more women, not only from a content creator background, but also in, in the business side of things and in development. We've been able to use this Nexus project as an outlet 
outlet for women who are working in both traditional media and new media, interactive media, the whole range of media, and be able to find ways to break down silos and create more opportunities for women. We really want to address that aspect, the gender imbalance, and WIFT is a great partner to really help us reach that audience and to talk about the successes that women have had in these fields. The Nexus Project wouldn't exist without the support of the Ontario Media Development Corporation through their Entertainment and Creative Cluster Partnership Fund. Through that, we've been able to get the funding to really bring these diverse creators together, these, these different sectors, because they realize the value and the importance of cross-sector collaboration. It's really exciting for me to be able to meet these women and share their excitement and let them know that there are organizations out there that believe in them and support them and want to see them succeed. So yeah, that, it's a little uh, little glossy version of the social engineering is, is uh, it's a little harder than than that, but um, and messier. But uh, uh, it was the first iteration that we um, that we tried of that particular kind of doing outreach to underrepresented groups, and um, as a result of it, we've we've actually seen um, uh, uh, an entirely new uh, games group in Toronto emerged called uh, Dames Making Games, um, uh, made up largely of, of people who are in the, the, um, uh, the incubators, and, and um, uh, yeah, the, the, the community is a, is a lot more diverse as a result of it, so um, yeah. Um, so we don't really have regular funding as, as a video game arts organization yet, because the concept of video game arts organization is still like a hard sell in some cases. Um, but we do have a volunteer pool, pool of nearly 800 people, and we end up doing quite a lot um, of, of, of projects as a result of that. So concurrent with the development of the hand eye, I started another feature um, with volunteer power. Our goal was to do something like infest wisely, uh, but for it not to look and sound so distractingly bad. Um, because, you know, it kind of sounded like shit, and uh, we knew we had to work on that. So this time, our, our uh, budget really ballooned out of control. Um, so uh, before that, uh, I was, I was going to show you uh, the trailer for it. Some people saw disaster, they saw opportunity. Do you find this shocking the way we live? And to survive, some of them have to do jobs that no one in China would do. I make money at this job by um, mentioning products, mentioning brands. I love Tim To Chang Sao, United Mutual Fund, Bayview Crest Hospital, Quinella Sol Rebutin. I mean, basically I do work, it's just not the work they're paying me to do. You know when you go in world and signs and stuff are blurred out for copyright reasons? I'm the guy who does that. What it's using there is called the claw. I'll use that to grab the goss. Look at that. Oh, shit. Woo! See, so told you, Harry, good, good haul today. Our whole family got screwed over when the cloud was repossessed. I mean, all of our data was there. You know, all of it. Network, legal, authenticators. Parents had to start from scratch. <laughs> Bag it, man. I'm very aware that we are lucky to have any work in robotics living in the West. There is a market for refurbished babies, but you don't get that much for them, and it's not technically legal. Uh, so Karen will probably just salvage what she can for projects. We don't plan on making babies forever. That's not the plan. I mean, maybe if we could afford to move to the east, it would make a difference. The Cantonese slang for the indigenous North Americans is ghosts. And these days, they are more in danger of being invisible to us than ever before. Perfect. 
so yeah, so that was um, that was the movie we made last or that we put out last year. Um, basically, yeah, I, we we uh, intended for it to be um, uh, for it to be a no budget movie. We wanted to see how far we could go with a no budget movie, and our and our, our budget unfortunately ballooned out of control. So the the whole feature ended up costing four thousand um, dollars. Now uh, the one the reason why we were able to do that was because. Um, Everybody basically worked for free, myself, to every single person on, on the project. And we had 50 volunteers uh, working a, like a total 7,000 hours over three years to make it. So yeah, so that's, that's, um, uh, that's the kind of the latest kind of, uh, I guess, iteration of, of uh, my work with volunteer power and indie culture. Um, but before I take questions, I just wanted to throw out some final thoughts. Um, these, these are some of my uh, sort of takeaways from 25 years of indie culture making. Um, so I, I've released lots of things that are flawed but interesting, um, and especially that happens in the first couple times I'm doing something new in a medium. Um, and this might be, if you're considering it yourself, like it, is, it, it can be like a kind of exercise in humility. You can kind of like, um, you know, it, it, in my case, having put out a, a bunch of fairly polished uh, books, um, to go back to uh, the point where I was like putting out stuff that was pretty rough in movies, um, it, it, it took a little bit of, uh, um, of wanting to put it out there. Um, but what I find is that um, I get sort of uh, really good feedback from anything I put out in the world. Like it's fine to, to sort of show it to some friends and put it back into your, into your, uh, into your drawer or whatever. But um, truthfully, you're going to get a lot more feedback if um, and, and, and a lot more sort of useful feedback if you put it out into the world. The other great thing about putting stuff out that's flawed is that often someone, uh, say for instance, the lighting's poor in, in, your, in your movie, um, someone who knows how to do lighting will probably come up to you and say, yeah, your lighting really sucked, and maybe I can help you with it the next time. And, uh, and it's almost like you, by putting something out there, you kind of gather the team around you for the next one. And that's, that's basically one of the things I did. So uh, the game community is pretty awesome. And this is, as someone who's been in a bunch of different uh, indie communities, um, I really haven't felt as, as uh, much a connection to a community since I've been in the zine community. Um, now, when I was in publishing and film worlds, um, there's a little bit of difference um, with the people that are, th that are there. I think, I think not, not all, of course, but many people are attracted to those jobs because they're stable, because they can tell their grandmother, oh, I work as a like an editor in a publishing house, and they, your grandmother will understand what that means. But if you're willing to work in the games industry and sort of like face a blank look from someone at a cocktail party when you say what you do, then usually you're a passionate person and you have a certain amount of open-mindedness. Um, and that makes me really excited to be part of it. Um, Another thing is, is that the disruptive ideas and, and models I was bringing to publishing and film worlds, um, like it would always get a few people interested in, the, in those worlds. But in the games world, anything I feel like I, I bring to it is, is met uh, with open arms and really embraced. Um, there's a real interest and hunger for, for things like this in, in, in the, in the uh, video game world. So community building, obviously uh, you've heard almost every single medium I get involved with uh, compulsively I seem to do uh, some kind of community um, building. And, and that to me is not altruism. It's, it's, it's basically almost a kind of uh, creative work in a, in a, in a, in a different format. Um, it's thinking about what, what do I want now and, and who are the people that could sort of like uh, join forces with me to, to make this happen. Um, what would I have wanted when I started in this medium? Like just sort of finding little ways to sort of help people as they kind of enter the medium um, and things like that. And, and, and I think to, to a large extent, when people are helping each other, um, it's harder to, to slip into the sort of zero sum thinking, which means that to a certain extent, you know, in, in any community, you can kind of get a weird tension around, I, I saw it in the books industry a lot, where, where someone would get a book deal and then other people would be looking at that person as if they took their book deal, or as if there was only one book deal to be had. And it's this idea that, with zero-sum thinking, that 
if one person wins, another loses. And, and I feel like when you, when you put energy into community building, it comes, it comes back in, in, a, in, a, in a remarkable way. I, I can say personally, beyond the good vibes of you know, helping out the community, I, I've had tons of collaborative opportunities and some financial sort of ones as well. Um, so that is to say, if, if you don't want to build community, you're not going to. But if you want to but feel like I shouldn't, I should focus on my art, I feel like there's a real opportunity to develop uh, another side of yourself and, and also to help yourself down the line in some respects or even to help your past self. I don't know if that's possible. When they figure out time travel, then it'll, it'll sort of make sense. So yes, my last, my last comment is this suffer for your art meme, which I fucking hate. I hate it, and, and it seems to dog me from like my, the early days of writing when I had writing teachers talking about James Joyce and how oh, he spent the whole morning writing a paragraph and he erased it all except for one word, and it was just, it's just this terrible, terrible model um, that, that, you know, I, I see it in, in the comics world as well, people who are drawing like just self, they're punishing themselves on some level. Um, there's a lot of masochism, obviously, and self-hate in the, in the art world, and, and this sort of suffer for your art thing really, really sort of reinforces it. Now, Indie Games the Movie, anybody seen that? Anybody? Indie Game the Movie? So Indie Game the Movie was a, was a milestone in, in some respects for, for, for Indie Games because it showed um, basically uh, uh, a community that a lot of people were really excited about um, in a, in a sort of uh, documentary format, in an older medium, essentially. So when it, it sort of, it was, it was at Sundance and, and people were sort of like saying, finally, you know, we're being taken seriously. But I had many, many problems with the, with the movie, but the one um, that, that, that was the worst for me was that um, no one was having fun making their game in Indie Game the movie. No one was having any fun. It was all torture. It was all in self-imposed torture, but it was just, it, it presented this notion that somehow uh, the game making was just as real as other art making because it was painful. And that's such a terrible sort of argument to make. And, and the fact that basically by absorbing the baggage of art, like the negative things about art, it legitimizes it somehow, is, is, is a terrible model. I don't think that, you know, art should always be, you know, wonderful and easy, but it can be a joyful expression. And the fact that it's being, it's being sort of that this, that this terrible meme is coming to uh, the, the, the games world is something I think we should, we should like, uh, stop. <laughs> so, the other thing is, I mean, we see enough exploitative practices in AAA world, and I, and I don't think we need to see it spread to indie game and art, art game sort of world as well. And at some point, um, Paolo joked about Unmanned when, when it was being sort of, when we were touring it and stuff, that we probably spent more time um, talking and touring with the game than we did actually making it. And, uh, and that that's actually a kind of a good rebuttal to this whole notion that it isn't the ba it shouldn't be the baseline. Um, we should we should uh, we should sort of embrace the the notion that art making can be a joyful thing. And um, yeah, I think that's it for me. So um, I just uh, wanted to take questions at this point and uh, uh, feel free to get in touch. That's my information there. Let me just make one one announcement on Friday. Um, that's what I'm trying to take, right? There it is. No, where is your browser? Our browser. Okay, Firefox. Um, sorry. So on Friday. There it is, that. Uh, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> so, on Friday at from 10 to 2, Jim is going to do this workshop at the Game Lab, which is on the third floor of this building. 
and there the info is um, at the UCLA Game Lab website. So you can join us for that. Um, anything quick you want to say about that? Uh, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. So hands-on writing interactive fiction games. So that's on Friday. Mm -hmm. But yeah, let's take questions. Hey, uh, sorry. Um, you mentioned getting people to, uh, working with volunteers and getting people to work for free. Mm -hmm. um, so I've had a little bit of experience with that. Can you talk about sort of like how that sustains over the long term? And, you know, do you find yourself getting to a point where it, it ever bec becomes a liability? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so one of my, one of my sort of uh, uh, pet metaphors is that, um, Working with volunteer power is kind of like working with solar power or wind power, which is that um, if, you, if you have a lot of money to throw at it, it's sort of like gasoline. It works every time, turn it on, it works, or whatever. Um, solar power can be you know, a little bit of a, a craft to learn how to, how to uh, work with. And, and that's, but when it does work, it's, it's amazing. It's like almost, it's coming out, out of nowhere and it's free and all the rest of it. Um, it really, you know, like I, I work with um, uh, the hand eye. As I say, we, we have a we have a pretty large group of people, um, and and what what it re what it comes down to is essentially a kind of um, filtration process of like giving people a kind of a small task to do because these are people just from the internet that just put put their email in said yes I'd love to volunteer. Um, so a lot of the times it requires a sort of like a fairly um, several stage process of like, um, you know, uh, getting them to show up for something and, and giving them something that isn't integral that they show up for. Like so we, we would have backups and we would have, you know, um, or I could be the backup in some cases. What I found is nine times out of ten people do show, but you have to be ready for the fact that sometimes people aren't going to. Um, and, and beyond that, it's just sort of finding out in like person by person what their interests are and how it intersects with, with what you're doing. Like it's, not, it, you know, like some people will agree to do anything, but then if they don't have any motivation and there's no personal stake, then they're not likely to follow through or they will follow through and they'll, and they'll kind of like feel like they didn't get anything out of the bargain. So I think it's, it's, it, it's a fair amount of work. Like, uh, and it's not just a quick substitute. Like, oh, we'll just get volunteers to do it. Like, like I've been doing it for f ten or fifteen years, and and it's and it's it is it is a craft uh, essentially that you have to uh, that have, you have to learn um, what works for you and and how you know. Like, uh, honestly, sometimes like um, I've worked in in both situations where I've hired people and 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 where I've worked with volunteers, and there are downsides to hiring people too. Like, the downside is that they will show up sometimes and really mentally not be there, or really, like, just be kind of getting through it. You know, like, there are downsides to, to sort of paid labor as well. Um, but, I, I, like, that, that is to say, like, I mean, um, to a certain extent, these projects only are able to happen, like, in the case of the, the movie, they're only able to happen because people were enthusiastic about them. So in some ways, it, it's kind of a good litmus test as to um, if, your, if your project really uh, is, is, you know, has, has the momentum behind it. Will people do it, will people work on it for free? If the answer is yes, then there's probably, um, you know, a pro, a, a, it's pr probably got a pretty good uh, momentum behind it. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Hi, Jim. So I, I would like to get a little bit to this point you made towards the end about the uh, this um, suffer for your art meme. Yeah. I would like to you to talk a little bit about more about that. So also how how you understand it because how how is that related with this uh, like notion of quality and ambition uh, or is it are you talking mostly about like suffer for your art sort of like as a kind of a like a, this kind of a like. A Modernist solitary pursuit with with certain kind of details. You mentioned James Joyce or that because I have a feeling, you know, myself, you know, in my writings or 
I, I try to sort of like <laughs> achieve a certain kind of quality in my stuff. And actually, unfortunately, it takes a little bit of an effort to sort of like reach a certain level. So I'm just sort of like so that it flows, so it's deep enough, whatever. I'm just wondering if these values, uh, I mean, that um, don't matter that much, much in the kind of work that you do or in the method of your working or or is it more about certain, but also linked with the certain kind of collab collaborative, collaborative model of working or something? So, so to sum up, so I couldn't quite get all the sort of like implications of this sort of like what you threw on the on the on the on the screen about sure. that topic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a that's a good point. I mean, uh, I don't want to give the impression um, I uh, look down on people who who try. <laughs> you know, like I I, I think that, that people who try hard and work hard. And uh, um, and really focus on something that's amazing, and, and largely that's what I aim to in my in my work as well. Um, the suffer for your art thing, uh, I think, uh, sort of the thing that that bothers me the most about it, I think, is is just that um, there's this public perception that if something uh, that it's that it's a, that it's a marker of legitimacy, that if something is that it has caused suffering. It, uh, it, it somehow, it must have really been worth it for them. Whereas in people aren't looking at the quality of the work or the innovation of the work or where the work is pushing, they're looking at external kind of markers to, to sort of like, you know, decide whether this person is a real artist. And that to me is, 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 uh, is really limiting in terms of like, um, if, if suff the suffering artist is privileged over the joyful artist, I think I think that's a very superficial kind of distinction um, for people to make. I, I want people to try harder and say, "Oh, I, I, I read their book and you know it, it had this impact for me." Not to look at the cover and say, "Well, that guy grew up in hard circumstances. It must be important work." And I think a lot of times people do make those um, do make those choices. And I, when I see it coming to the games world, it, it sort of uh, yeah, makes me sick. <laughs> so I mean that, yeah, just simply saying that, I mean that I guess that this sort of like suffer for your art in a certain way is, is really a meme, uh, which means a kind of a cliche, which doesn't uh, very often correspond with the, with the reality of creative work at all, because that, that suffering, the kind of suffering is, is not never, <laughs> as far as I see, it's so kind of like some kind of a pure thing. It is, it's a, it's kind of pleasurable thing. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's about, trying to sort of like stretch your limit because you want to do it, you need to do it for some reasons. You don't necessarily always know the reasons and stuff like that, but I mean that, but I don't see it sort of like a kind of a, like a masochistic uh, sort of like um, drive in that sense uh, at all. So it's just kind of like a, like James Joyce, I mean, just he, he just had to do what he had to do mm -hmm. and we still read his stuff, you know. Uh, yeah, and I agree, but I think that, that the fact that we look at that methodology and say, well, that's what a writer should do, that's, a, that's, a pro that's problematic to me. So, um, the other, yeah, the other thing with the, um, uh, oh yeah, the, like, I mean, yeah, when it comes to like, um, um, uh, no, lost it, go, sorry, next, <laughs> next question. Hi, um, you mentioned at the beginning um, something about um, rejecting, like an offer that you got. Um, Sorry? No, I mean, you mentioned at the beginning, like rejecting, like purposely rejecting an offer that you got at one point oh, yes, in your yes. career. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been thinking like, um, what, what of sort of the, your very diverse work would you sort of like, like label or do you see working on the sort of an expanded arts field or or what or maybe like what kind of art do you sort of like see positioned sort of against um, against art or against the field of art? Sorry. Okay, I try again. Um, so sort of like do you see like is everything that you do art is some part of what you do art? Hmm. Um. Uh, well, this is completely irrelevant. No, no. I mean, I, I, I like making stuff. Like, I like making stuff. Um, 
I don't concern myself, I, I, I don't think overly with the, the art question. I take it as a given, it's arts. It's, it's in a medium. I mean, the only time where, where it's contentious is when I make games and call them art, and people you know, sometimes have an issue with that. But um, uh, yeah, for the most part, I, I just like, um, I like making things that often I, I'm inspired by the fact that I watch a movie and I'm like, oh, that, that was really great. I, I want to do that. You know, I think that's a natural impulse that's been basically trained out of us by, um, you know, by, you know for, for good reasons. For a long time, you had to be a very, you, you, there had to be a, a number of things money-wise and specialization-wise in place for you to be a filmmaker. Now that it isn't, uh, and that, that was where I started getting really interested in, in making movies because those barriers were removed. Um, you know, and so for, yeah, for, for things that are, um, you know, open, I, I also just like the idea that now these things are open to us. Um, and, and I almost do them in the hopes that other people will, will want to, like, do them too. Like, uh, because sometimes, even though the technological barriers are down, the cultural ones are still up, and there's still the notion of people who are, um, more legitimate in that in that role as a filmmaker they go to film film school or they have like you know a, a, they, they've been a film nerd their whole life or neither of which I've done so I, I think I think one of the things that kind of allows me to kind of jump hop mediums a lot is I kind of I'm wired in a certain way that I enjoy being places I'm not supposed to be like for whatever reason I kind of there's something about me that gets a, a thrill out of that so, uh, so I think where most people would be like, oh, I'm in this world that I shouldn't be in, I want to get out of here. I'm kind of like, huh? Eh? I'm here now. Huh? <laughs> and and it's, it's weird, but um, it definitely makes it easier for me, whereas in other people, it would be, it would be, a, it would be a struggle, right? So, anyway. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how what you, you know, everything you talked about now and what you do in your life uh, relates to the themes that you write about in your books or in your movies or games because I've noticed like um, you know uh, like uh, Ghosts with Shit Jobs and Everyone in Silico was very explicitly anti-corporate and anti-consumer um, whereas what you uh, you know what you talked about today is a much more positive outlook shall I say. Yeah um yeah, I guess, I, I mean, I, I definitely, my um, critique of, of corporations and of power, consolidated power is, I mean, it, it goes through, I think, probably more, my more establishment stuff um, more readily, like stuff that is, I feel a mo more of an urge in, in a book form or in a, in a movie form to maybe be a little bit more didactic or polemic or, um, uh, that kind of thing, as opposed to some of my game work is is very, um, uh, you know, like I mean, if you look for it, you can see the politics. But for the most part, um, I feel like almost like working in the medium of games is politic in itself. Like taking games seriously is kind of um, is kind of is kind of enough, and to some extent. So I don't know if that answers your question, but the sense of like uh, often when I'm working in a medium, uh, I I'm conscious of that medium and w what that cultural position of that medium is, uh, and it affects my work for sure. So you, you talk a lot about um, corporate, um, you know, anti-corporate activism and uh, how technology barriers are being brought down. But what do you think is the uh, indie games community's uh, role? in uh, also changing the landscape of tools for making these indie games? Well, it's interesting. I, I met with the guys um, who, uh, um, uh, who run the hum Humble Bundle um, and, uh, and also uh, have a game company called Wolffire, which has been very sort of open source. Um, and, and it's, it's, and they, and they're, they're, they're big advocates for, for open source tools and for sort of thinking about the politics of, of like, um, the tools they're using and stuff like that. Um, I mean, for, for indie game developers, 
The thing that I find interesting, as I say, is that I, is I've noticed that there is a difference between um, the indie game, like the indie, the divide between indie and corporate in the games world, and um, I think it's really amazing at the moment. But um, I think the reason for it is because a win for one is a win for all. So if an indie game comes out that changes how people think of games or diversifies what people think of games, um, the corporate guy gets a little bit of credibility for that, and vice versa. If Katamari Damashi comes out through a, through a corporate um, Namco or whatever, then the indie guy also kind of benefits from it because, like, it, as I say, a win for one is a win for all. Um, that's a result of its current um, cultural position as an underdog or as, as a dismissed, kind of uh, maligned kind of gutter genre. Um, now, when that changes and when games do become as respectable as books, for instance, or as films, then um, you'll probably see more of a division uh, between uh, the indie and the corporate because um, you know because you know there 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 won't be that sort of united cause in some respects uh, and also as it becomes more powerful that that video games become more powerful it'll attract people who are attracted to power to those those positions and mostly attracted to power, not necessarily motivated by passion for games or whatever. So I think it's a really interesting time right now. I think, as I say, I believe um, maybe contentiously that um, there is a symbiosis between the indie and the, and the corporate world at the moment, but I, I do believe that can shift to parasitism like very easily and it could in the next five or 10 years where basically you know, the, the more conventional kind of uh, dynamic of, um, you know, the major labels uh, kind of using the indies as like an R&D sort of uh, department for, for like the next big thing. Like in the music industry, there is that huge division and, and, a, and a parasitism that happens there. And, and I think it definitely over time could, could shift that way with, with games as well, but. Um, can you speak? about your <coughs> view on writing within the context of games? Uh, sure. I, I feel like all the things that I couldn't squeeze into this talk have come up with questions, so thanks very much. So writing in games. Um, the thing I hate about writing in games is um, that at the moment there's always like a talk on how to break into writing in games, and, and I feel like it's kind of uh, dream baiting if that makes sense. It's, it's basically, it's kind of appealing to the people that, you know, would really like to be involved with games, but really writing is their main core strength or whatever. Uh, and they look at this, this is totally possible. I could become like the guy who writes the next Dishonored or something. And I think for the most part, it's not gonna happen. I mean, obviously there are like five or six people that have those very specialized jobs at like high quality enough AAA studios that care about writing, you know, and but they're very, very rare. And I think overall, writing in games, like as as a novelist, I would love to say, oh great, I can just sort of like shift into games as easily as I shifted into movies. It's like with movies, it's like a narrative structure, it's very clear, linear kind of path. Um, but with games, it's much more, much more um, of a of a of a of a shift. And and the main thing is is that you know, there are things about my, that are in my tool chest as, as a games writer, namely characterization, um, environment, tone, all those things are totally applicable when sort of uh, working on a game. But plot isn't. I mean, plot hopefully, at least partially, is told by your player, you know. So th it, it, you can pick and choose amongst the kind of, the things that, that a writer would do, but you can't just say, oh yeah, just throw a writer in there and it'll be better. Like, I mean, you know, for the most part, um, you know, I, I think that writers should learn how to do other shit <laughs> as well. I just learned how to do level design, you know, that's, that's like, uh, I, I think you, you, if, if you're a writer, you need to sort of learn other, even if it's promotion or, um, you know, figuring out how to do some business side of things or like, you know, like you, it, it's really, it's a very specialized skill that isn't as integral as it is in other mediums, and I feel like um, people are kind of self-deluding themselves if they think that they're going to be kind of the, 
the, the lottery winner that gets into those, into those positions. In general, I think everybody should try to make a game on their own. Um, even like, I mean, I, I've made plenty of games on my own and I can't draw, I can't, you know, music, I'm, I'm terrible at a lot of those things. But what happens as you go through that process is that you learn a respect for all the positions um, in a team and you are able to communicate better with those people um, on your next project. And you also get a sense of like, you know, who knows, you might put out something that is super interesting and uh, maybe someone else that becomes a collaborator down the line will see, see that and say, hey, that like, it looks like crap, but the mechanic's really clever. I mean, you know, th those are the types of things you open yourself up for if you are willing to sort of try independent sort of route in the sense of like, you know, like the whole, the whole kind of like uh, do it yourself, don't do, it doesn't mean do it alone kind of beginning. The, the thing is, is that do it yourself is kind of one extreme. Like it, it's like a goalpost. Like if you have like a huge team on one side, you can have like you by yourself on the other. It doesn't mean you always have to go to that goalpost, but if it's, you know, if you give yourself that option, you have way more latitude for how you do things. So. Um, to kind of go along with that question, um, how do you think game makers should reconcile sort of the difficulty between, um, you know, giving the player a lot of interactivity, um, but also sort of establishing like an author's intent, like having, a, you know, a, a really a, a message or a purpose behind the game without taking away that interactivity and independence for the player? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, in general, yeah, the, the idea of interactive narrative, um, uh, like or or like when you're telling the story, essentially um, the player isn't telling the story. And if the player is totally telling the story, then you're not telling a story at all. So it's kind of where do you want to be on this teeter totter? Like you got to pick your spot. And sometimes like at different points, the sandbox sort of model is really trendy, and everybody's saying that's the best type of games. And then on the other side, when the pendulum swings, people are saying, oh, narrative, like linear games, that's where it's at. It's like a real story is being told. But I mean, it's, it's, entirely, it's entirely up to you where you want to position that. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is like that if, if someone experiences something, if someone goes through it, if someone becomes complicit, um, it's it's way more impactful. It's kind of like the the, ver the, the thing it is, that it's sort of closest to in writing is when when you're reading a, st a story and you realize, oh, that's because he's the guy who killed the guy, or you you in your own head work it out yourself. That's kind of that's that's such a beautiful moment, and and that was a moment probably crafted by the the author, um, but it's so much more powerful if it happens in your own head first rather than being told explicitly what's happening. So rather than forcing your, your player's hand, you really want to provide kind of opportunities for them to discover um, things on their own. And it, cause it's, it's way more powerful when you experience them that way. Not cause it's better or worse, just cause it's, it's, it's a really powerful thing to, to sort of, um, uh, to sort of give your reader or your player. Anybody else? Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Oh, yeah, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't human spam Ghost of Shit Jobs, which is available on iTunes. You can tell your friends, you know. Thanks. <laughs>